This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of When Science Speaks. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting, a training and advocacy firm in Washington, D.C. that helps scientists and engineers get funding, gain influence, and build key relationships with the stakeholders that matter the most. Dr. Lauren Robertson currently is a Biogen PhD fellow and a science and media consultant at IQ360, a PR communications and digital reputation management firm. She previously served as program coordinator at Emerson College for the innovative Ask for Evidence public awareness campaign about the need to question the credibility and sourcing of public information related to science. At Emerson, Lauren taught students and select faculty the best ways to incorporate evidence-based curricula into their classrooms and manage the artistic design and promotion of Boston subway ads related to Ask for Evidence. Lauren served as a research assistant to and lab manager at Harvard University, where her work included performing independent research on calorie restriction and surgical stress relevance while managing the daily operations and ordering of the lab. She also authored three publications, two of which she was first author, while at the lab. Lauren earned her PhD in biological sciences from Harvard University and her BA in government with a minor in Spanish and pre-med coursework from Smith College. Lauren, you have a really unique background that includes work experience in local government, an undergraduate degree in comparative international relations and politics, communications expertise, and of course your PhD in biological sciences. That is really unusual to have talent in those very dimensions. And so I'm wondering to what factors would you attribute your interest and your ability in these varied areas? Mark, I think it's a great question. <clears throat> so I would say first off, um, one funny thing about me is that I didn't really talk. For anyone that knows me, they would find this completely unrealistic, but I actually didn't speak until I was maybe like two. Like I didn't really say any words. And then once I did start speaking, I kind of just never stopped talking. Um, and so my parents really tried to sort of like beat that quality out of me, like, you know, think before you speak and um, sort of be intentional with your words. And I think the commonality, therefore, between my interest in things like public policy and science became sort of this, this curiosity for observation um, and for trying to figure out patterns and understand how disparate things sort of connected together, both on sort of a micro and macro level. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, you know, maybe this, this is what sort of drove me to science was I found that humans are just so complex that they're very hard for me to understand. And so it, it was easier to move uh, from public policy to something um, more sort of molecular, cellular in nature, and be able to sort of understand how those systems, which were already so diverse, could uh, layer upon one another and uh, interconnect. And of course, this would ultimately you know, drive me back to sort of the most complex systems, to me at least, which, which would be human in the form of public policy and government or whether it's drug development, which is what I'm currently in. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is fascinating, Lauren. And just let me ask you, because you have the, you continue to have this deep, deep expertise in both, both camps. Um, how would you say maybe one, you know, your, your public policy um, aspect and your science aspect, how did they one sort of inform the other or if at all? So I think uh, the thread there is interesting. It's something I know that you're working closely on is, and particularly in our current political environment. And I, I mean this current political environment, not just here with the United States, but sort of on a global level. Um, I think it's about beginning to critically think about what facts mean and what facts mean to different people and how facts can sort of be manipulated. And I mean, it's something that I'm sure we'll talk about throughout this sort of discussion between you and I today. But I think for me, I see that facts can be, like there's many different types of facts that we can use, that we can lead from to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about finding A, like the right facts that, that are really true to the core of the issue, but then being able to 
put that into a story and connect that to an audience in a way that they can enter from that angle as well. Because like, I, mean, I can tell, <clears throat> One of my favorite things is to kind of look at how many different ways I can tell the same story, whether that's my PhD dissertation or, um, you know, a product I'm working on, a, a drug, a therapeutic or a disease modifying therapy that I'm working on or a disease or unmet medical need that I'm working on. I can, I can come into a problem from multiple aspects. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think understanding um, sort of the analytical skills behind it, which is what drove me into getting a PhD as opposed to going straight into, into politics is I wanted to know the, the nitty gritty of the issues. And then I can speak to sort of the multiple layers of how that impacts society or finances or the global world or um, infrastructure, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, having that vision, maybe as some would argue that it's not as deep, you know, I'm not going to know every single detail, but I disagree with that too. It's like, I can know every single detail. Am I going to know every single detail of every single detail? Absolutely not. I don't want to know that, you know, um, I'd rather know sort of greater breadth and depth and be able to weave that into um, an impactful narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like just my family's from coming from sort of the advertising background. So I'm not saying this, maybe my language sounds like I'm talking about spin. It's not for the purpose of spin. It's to really capture the full holistic picture of what is going on. Um, and I think it's negligent to leave out out those parts and to not see those interconnected um, aspects. Mm -hmm. Like talking about money without talking about race, or about race without talking about money, like, you know, and like gender dynamics, like all of those are interconnected and we need to talk about all of them at the same time. So I think um, that was important to me was to really understand a science and, and the society in which we live so that we can change that science. So interesting. Well, yes, we're, we're definitely going to go deeper and get to this. Um, I want to talk about some transitions because uh, you've made some really interesting transitions. Interesting in the sense that, you know, a lot of people don't have the ability to make such transitions, like going from a government major to a research analyst, a research assistant to lab manager, um, authoring three publications, you know, two of which you were first on. And so um, how were you able to make, how were you able to effectively and successfully make those transitions? Because transitions just generally, even within the same space can be a challenge. And you have made multiple transitions, like kind of between spaces. Yeah, that's true. And I, I think a part of it is, um, you know, my parents grew me up with just like so, I mean, I think it's part of just my natural personality where I'm just kind of like, I'm not going to be held back by being afraid. You know, I think a big, you know, Brene Brown talks about this a lot that you, we have to have vulnerability and sort of genuine vulnerability to be courageous. Mm -hmm. And in no way am I saying that I've done anything sort of courageous um, to, in, in sort of societal way. I definitely haven't, but I think for myself, I've tried to live my life, um, you know, vulnerable and courageous. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a big part of that is also having, you know, no one really sees the in-between steps between the transitions. They just sort of see the big transition. So I think it's important to sort of talk about that and be open about those um, advantages that we've had and, and advice that have been given for me. You know, I, a lot of this has to do with having really great um, mentors. So coming out of uh, boarding school, I went to Loomis Chafee School and coming out of my senior year there, I had that fabulous opportunity of taking hands-on scientific classes. And one of the, the best pieces of advice that my uh, professor at the time gave me, Simon Holdaway, was, and I, the rest of the class as well, is um, you have an advantage. You've learned these molecular biology and microbiology lab-based skills that are, you know, taught in in college or, you know, and used in labs, mm -hmm. um, which is already an insane privilege uh, and, and should be sort of given more, I believe, I really believe in this sort of experiential learning mm -hmm. like, and not the boring like lab classes that we have in college, which like, uh, oh my God, I, this still give me like a nightmare. <laughs> so boring, so bad. But is, is that, he said, you have this advantage and you can do two things with it. You can kind of squalor, you know, squander it or you can keep building upon it. And he's like, you're only going to build upon it if you keep doing it. Like you, you use that skill and keep building upon it. And so I went into undergrad and I wasn't even a science major. Um, it was like my first, it was fall semester, I think. And I just walked up, did research on a couple labs that I was most interested in and walked up and just did like I did when I got my first job when I was 13 years old. I walked up to them and I was like, I have no experience in this except for X, Y, and Z, but I promise I won't let you down and like, I'll do whatever it takes. I have to clean dishes for the first semester and, you know, shadow grad student or 
one of your um, post talks, then I'll do that. Like I'll do whatever it takes. I'm here to learn and I'm a fast learner, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think just like staying reliable and, and just saying yes to a lot of situations and opportunities. Um, and then, you know, trying to deliver my best, I think made a huge transition. So I had done, I'd worked in a lab most of my time uh, through undergrad. And when the market crashed in 2008, the, my, my political science um, fellow majors were the ones that were like, Lauren, we keep seeing all these jobs on Craigslist, like in, in research, you should just apply for this job. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to do more like research. Um, and then, yeah, I just found some opportunities and, and really fell in love with it. So um, I ended up through, through actually an ex who, who uh, passed me on to one of her, her friends to get um, sort of recommendations on uh, who, should be doing like sort of good opportunities in scientific research that's sort of what pushed me in that direction so I, again I have to sort of thank all of my uh, personal and professional contacts for uh, giving you you know connecting with people and networking with me with people and then for those people for taking a chance on me um, you know my first boss at Harvard uh, James James Mitchell was just an incredible I mean an incredible mentor like absolutely I mean he told me if you don't like you know he, he was like if you don't apply to grad school and even if you don't matriculate your grad school, if you don't apply, he was like, I will fire you. Yeah. Um, because he was like, I will be, otherwise I'll be doing a disservice to you and, and your future. Mm -hmm. And he, we just, we had a great, I mean, I was a research assistant, but he allowed me sort of those full of bounds to really um, act and behave like a graduate student. And so I hold him personally accountable for my pursuing the PhD. So if it, it does or does not work out now that I'm graduated, if it doesn't quote, quote, pay off, you know, he'll be the first one on my chopping list. <laughs> um, well, and thanks for sharing sharing that backstory, Lauren, because, uh, you know, it's funny, like, it's kind of like the overnight success, like everyone is, you know, yeah, it was, it was 15 years, you know, seeing uh, open mic nights or, you know, like, at, you know, in front of like two people, and then all of a sudden, like, you see them, uh, you know, with the, you know, really popular out there and it's like oh what an overnight success but people don't understand all the work and the connections and and as you um very rightly pointed out you know the opportunities that that led you i mean you you had this attitude and approach um which is you know really the the prerequisite um but uh, that was really really helpful to understand uh how you were able to make that transition and you know it it, 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 it's, it seems to be working out and I'm going to sort of get to the ne next question, which relates to that, which True. is, you I know, think it's also well, one quick thing I'd add in, please, go ahead. I think is really important is, and I may have said it, but it's like taking, like saying yes, particularly early on in your career for things like not, and just making the best of it. You know, it's like I served coffee to New England bio labs, executives and researchers during a summer workshop um, that was run in collaboration with my boss, Stephen Williams, who was working on a, a WHO and CDC a global elimination program for lymphatic photorhesis. And it's like, like you know, there's a HHM, he's an HHMI faculty, Howard Hughes Medical Investigator. And so I ended up getting sort of research opportunities to work on um, the molecular biology of these parasites during the summer. But in addition, I was also, you know, really just kind of like grinding as far as you know, serving coffee or being around or helping out in the lab or kind of being a gopher, you know, and I think a lot of people in um, the music business or um, production or, or modeling and stuff, you know, I have, I have a lot of friends and family in this business um, do similar things and talk about similar things. And I think a lot of people think that it's different when it's the sciences or academia, but like don't underestimate the power of like lifting a hand or washing a dish. It's like not being too proud to do sort of the, the dirty grunt work. Right. Um, this right. is big all across science, particularly in sort of infectious disease and development work. You know, the people that are really willing to pull up their 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 shirts, you know, sleeves, I mean, get sort of muddy and dirty, you know, figuratively and literally, um, I think are the ones that, that end up getting sort of the the early worm or whatever, just to combine a bunch of sayings all together here. Uh, Your point is definitely clear though. And you know, I, I started answering phones in, in Marky's office. You know, I was an unpaid intern for three months. And uh, yeah, you know, there, there is definitely something to be said about, about that and doing it, like you said, without any pretension, you know, that there's nothing sort of below or beneath, you know, if you can, it, it's a, it sends a strong message about character and, and people want to, you know, want to work with people like that. It is, and I think it's also, it's not just about, I totally agree 
it's not just about sort of the self-promotion of like, I was humble and now I'm going to get paid off for it. Like, I think that's a different sort of generational perspective that everything you do is going to get paid off for it. You know, it's like do a PhD and then you'll quickly learn it's like not the case in general. Um, but I think it's also, it's really like it forms you as a person. Like some of the most valuable experiences I have are honestly from my first two jobs when I was like 10 years old. 12 years old, like working in my parents' restaurant full, like, you know, really heavily. And then 13 years old working in retail. Like, right. honestly, I bring up those, some of those points in interviews nowadays for venture capital firms or like, you know, other finance jobs all the time. Right. Like right. fundamental to my personality. Yeah. Yeah. No, I waited. I, I, I worked in catering and then I, I waited tables at our, um, a local Thai restaurant and it's such great training for, for reasons that, you know, that, I, that that everyone understands, just getting getting to know people, all different kinds of people, meeting them where they are, um, dealing and with talking with them and getting excited about stuff, right? Connecting with them. Right. We're, we're going to talk a lot today about communication. I think it's clear, you know, from how you communicate and and your career. I think too, the same aspects of you have to be able to talk with different stakeholders and, and really understand their point of view. You know, I mean, I think a part of it is. I'm, I'm not literally on the spectrum, but like I, and I'm an empathetic person, but if I, I'm a very experiential learner. So if I haven't been there or done that or really connected with that person, really heard their story, I will not understand their story. I, I just won't. I'll, I'll maybe be able to tolerate it, but I will tolerate it, but I won't really be able to like appreciate and get into it. So it's helpful for me to kind of get those experiences and talk to those people so that I even understand where, where they're coming from, you know? Right, right. And there's curiosity behind it, too. I mean, you, you, you're a naturally curious person, want to learn. I mean, that's just, and it's authentic, which is kind of at the foundation, I think, of, of really connecting with people with authenticity and empathy. It is true. You just, I have to watch my energy sometimes. I feel like I'm like a, a bull in a china shop with the energy. It's like, I feel like people leave, they're just so exhausted afterwards. You're like, they're super pumped, but they're just not quite sure what they're pumped about, you know? No, it's all great. And let's get to this, this because this, this falls very much on to what we were just talking about with respect to communication. So you're getting your PhD. You, you're also teaching, well, when, when you were getting it, you know, you were also teaching faculty at Emerson College you know, how to effectively incorporate evidence-based curricula into their classrooms, you know, while managing the artistic design and promotion of Boston subway ads, which actually were related to an international campaign um, out of the UK called Ask for Evidence. And I, that's just a, for, to me, that's just such a, it's such an interesting, intriguing combo. And um, I'd love for you to tell that story. Yeah, well, it's funny, actually, I always try to think, you know, how did I even meet these people or like find out about this opportunity? And for whatever reason, that's completely skipped my mind. Like, you know, no joke, I'm, we're working on drugs here for, for Alzheimer's, the first drug in class. And I'm like, I'm like, can I please get a cognitive evaluation like pronto here? Um, but I think what's interesting about this is I, I don't remember exactly how I first met Amy Vashlish and Murray, who actually was a PhD in the neuro program in um, BBS, which is a program out of Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. um, sort of co a, a larger version of, of the program I was at Harvard School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. And um, not sure how I met her, but if she needed sort of a program coordinator and ultimately a dual to help her work on this campaign, both for her own sort of tenure work as a scientific communicator at Emerson, but then also just because she was extremely passionate about this sort of factual based um, sort of engagement with the public. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I mean, the biggest thing for me here is it was just the first time, again, coming back to the experiential part that I really saw and was on the ground working with other PhD scientists and postdocs um, and policymakers and stakeholders that that had taken their degree and used it in a different way. And I really believe, I was thinking about this question before we started speaking about it, and I was thinking, it just like opened up my ideas to like really hands-on public policy and scientific engagement. Mm -hmm. And what that sort of means and all the different avenues of that. Um, and I, it, it really changed the course of my life in the sense that from that work, um, I got really close with other people coming out of, it just happened to be the Harvard Education School. They have some great um, sort of neuro-based and educational digital-based sort of programming there that were really interested in, in sort of nonprofit work around scientific communication and really interested in um, artistic work 
Uh, and we ended up leading, for example, an event at Warehouse 11 in Somerville mm -hmm. that was all about scientific bias and containing and combining art from local artists. There are all different types of mixed media, some fabulous, fabulous painters that I, I now have sort of all over my bedroom, like um, Katie Wild and stuff, just to name a few, and, and really talking about the science behind their work and about sort of perceptions of bias, so whether it's racial or whether it's um, sort of cognitive dissonance, or you know, if you look up biases in psychology, it's unbelievable. It's like, I have another comparison, but it's not appropriate for this, for this interview, but just suffice to say, like, you look it up and there's just a long list of like, of potential biases, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it was really from that work that I just, again, like different ways to tailor scientific content in a way that's digestible and interesting and engaging for different types of audiences. <laughs> um, and so we had professors there, I mean, it was a lot of locals. We had, you know, people of all ages, old, young, scientists, non-scientists, sort of engaging and thinking about this work and thinking about how it in, in, impacted their own work. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's what's really magical about scientific communication is that um, particularly in the age of, of, you know, film and online and, um, infographics and um, you know there's this incredible MIT um, woman who does like scroll based stuff so like you're in a meeting and she'll like did like virtually map out through drawings and words like everything that you're talking about these interconnected systems so like you know I mean it's I'm a super visual person like I have like almost zero auditory memory um, I'm straight visual so if I see it once I'll sort of never forget it um, and so for me I, I just love this the combination of of sort of Hemingway-like concise words, um, direct to the point, really being accurate in the facts that we're choosing to showcase and, and really thinking deeply about what those facts mean and where they take the audience, you know, what, how they open it up and each word should mean something almost like a poet and then the visuals to go with it and the scientific um, backing and facts to go with it. I, I mean, to me, that's a perfect combination. Wow. And let me ask you on that. That is just so deep and so, so interesting. And also, you know, complex, which gets back to what you're saying at the beginning. Um, you know, people understand things. It's, it's kind of, can be very complicated to understand or to, to ascertain maybe exactly what moves or influences or resonates with, with people. And so as part of that experience, because as you were describing it, you know, people from all different walks of life and ages and so forth. What surprised you? Was there anything that surprised you as you were part of that process and maybe thinking like, oh yeah, this is, this is going to be the best way to, or maybe, you know, you, you, that you witnessed sort of as part of the discussion, like this is going to be the way to present this. And then it was like, actually, no, that, that's not it at all. You know, this <laughs> is else. that's okay. So I do, I'll go to your second point and then I'll like kind of, you know, switch back into the first, but I think this is a really interesting question. So the second point is, yes, I, I really believe that communication is iterative and that a big part of it is like preparatory work mm -hmm. um, in the sense like you got to try it out. You got to try it out with all different types of people. I mean, I think applying to science and, and, and scientific um, statements almost like a marketing research like you know you kind of like do it with a group of people you interview them you track their eyes and figure out what they're focusing on and why they're doing it what they're associating with it. i mean to me yes obviously it can be sort of you know misappropriate but i think we should do this i think we should think of of the we should understand the impact of our words um in both implicitly and then really study it mm -hmm. um, and really keep this in mind and so i think one thing that really amazed me um was just with so much wonder and almost like it's not naivete but it's like openness like childlike openness mm -hmm. that people approach um situations so like they may approach it with some sort of like kind of confidence like oh i know where this is going and like but then the minute they realize that it's like they are wrong or somebody's being taken off i think some people fear that they can get defensive in the space but sort of the the honest way that they're sort of shocked by their lack of understanding of it but like they're so intrigued with such fresh sort of fallen like eyes I think is to me like was so rewarding mm. I mean I, I love maybe like, this is you know sort of telling you my personality but I sort of love to it's not the right word but to surprise people or get people thinking to make people think like, huh you know what I mean like kind of rile people up a little bit like make people uncomfortable I think that's good we all need to be made uncomfortable sort of in, in safe ways mm. um, and I think 
there's something about the combination of art and then science that can really do that. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe I believe that, you know, I love art and I grew up in a very extremely artistic environment. Um, pretty much everyone in my life is very artistic in some way. So I, I think to me that that's an easier language to get to people. And then you, then you can hit them with the science later, you know? Right. Oh, so fascinating. You know, I like to say connect before you communicate. Um, it's kind of a tagline that I, that yes. I and it's, it's so, and you really did a beautiful job of, of you know, ex- describing and interpreting that experience that you had with the Ask for Evidence campaign and how that really shined through. And, and with respect to the artist and the scientist, you know, um, the, as, you, as you know, like the word scientist is a, is a relatively new word that just really kind of came into being, was invented in like the 1830s and 40s. Um, as the combination of knowledge and artists, you know, scientia and artist um, in one. So it's, you know, like an artist who knows things. Um, but mm. artistry, artistry is definitely, it's just, it's built into the word for science, uh, for scientists, which I always really love to, to remind people because it's that artistry sometimes that you and I are talking about actually, that artistry about how to connect and it's a different combination with different people. And it does take nuance and, and a real connection and understanding before even, you know, opening your mouth or hitting a key on the keyboard, you know, that, that, that foundation, that prerequisite that's so often missed, <laughs> skipped over, yes. um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. And, and I think that's the problem. And I think that's like, it's funny. I don't know if you know, do you know C.P. Snow? He had this kind of smaller book called, it's something related to politics and science. It's like one of sort of my, you know, sort of core, core, core sort of theoretic book that I, that I really believe in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't know if he ends up talking about sort of like art and science in there, but I mean, I, I always told friends, because many of my friends, you know, I, I never really talked about my science with them, which is ironic seeing as I'm all about sort of science and all about communication. So, you know, the irony of life, how we would fail in our own personal endeavors. But, um, I always told people that like I consider my like I consider I consider science and art. Um, I think that scientists tend to be a little bit more aggressive um, than a lot of artists, um, and way more paranoid. Ironically, even though like you know, unless they're a neuroscientist, they're probably taking less you know uh, psychedelics than most artists. But um, they're definitely making up for it in the sort of um, uh, being really sort of paranoid. It was going to like you know cheat them out of something or you know mm-hmm. sort of scoop them or something. So it's, it always makes me laugh. But, um, but they are really, they are artists. It's all abstract thinking. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, creating something and sort of testing it out. Um, it's all about how we sort of present that data back to the public and what, how people think about it and feel about it. And that's why I think it, like, it, is, it is the onus on us as scientists. If we feel like there's a failing in our current world about how science is perceived, it is our like our duty, our responsibility, not to like sit up in that glass house and keep ourselves further from from the public. But I think it's really to stay true to the science um, and try to stay apolitical, but also to really as much as we can. But you know, everyone's going to have different perceptions of that. But to really be engaged with the public, and I think we we can see from people like you know George Church or. Um, or even people like, um, you know, people who've led sort of the, the genetics, um, you know, Craig Walter and the uh, Academy of Science, Science and whatever else, because they've been too close to the public. So I think the, the fastest and, and quicker we move past this, and I think we are, I mm-hmm. think mm-hmm. has really changed that. They have become invested. They have become, you know, advocates for science. I mean, they know the most about it. Of course they need to be like, it's just completely ridiculous, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. And, you know, um, just one comment on that, you know, the distinction between partisan politics and politics is one that I think gets lost. Um, You know, saying that scientists shouldn't be involved in politics, well, there's really not a choice there. (laughs) Science is already intertwined and has been for for a long time because politics is is about power and, and scientists have a lot of power, a lot of credibility with the public, Um, a lot of uh, ability to shape, you know, public opinion about an issue, whether it's, you know, global warming or, or vaccines or something like, you know, these things that are so much with us in the policy realm, um, that's very different from partisan politics, you know, which party. And so I think that, you know, from my perspective, having scientists really embrace, 
you know, there's a reason why Galileo died under house arrest, right? I mean, you, you're, you know, when, when, you ha when you find evidence that actually it's the sun that's at the center and not the earth, and that conflicts with the, the, the other, you know, the church's dogma um, at the yes. time. Um, well, that's, a, you know, he becomes a competing power source. And, you know, that wasn't going to be acceptable. So, you know, he was, he was silenced. That's a type of getting involved in politics that, that we're really talking about, um, is, is embracing that, that role that's already, it's really already there. That power is, is already kind of embedded in the role of a scientist. I know. And I guess I even think, like, to take it to the, and so I'm, one of the things I studied in, in undergrad as a government major was um, epistemic communities. I think that's the right word. It's been like over 10 years. So mm -hmm. and plus that plus time plus failing brain equals, yeah, um, let's see if that word is correct. But I think it was epistemic communities. And when you look back through an epistemic meeting, essentially advisors to the government during any specific time. So if we look back in history, we see that, for example, during the, um, you know, the Soviet, but, you know, some people, some people want to say it's a Soviet conflict or, you know, the Cold War, however you want to refer to this period of time. Um, there was a lot of scientists, nuclear scientists, energy scientists. I mean, you look post-World War II and like, you know, I'm not trying to get into sort of weird um, political discussions, but we brought into the United States, I mean, our zoonotic disease on, on Plum Island, um, you know, many of these sort of large movements of scientific discovery, both on sort of atom level and on a biological and sort of medical level, has come out of these advisor communities to either international governments or the U.S. government. There's been other periods where we've been really focused on the epistemic community being lawyers, for example, or um, being medical doctors. So it's like to say that, you know, we can keep these stakeholders and advisors of these fields separate from, you know, quote, unquote, church and state or, or politics, I think is, you know, cutting ourselves off at the knee. I don't want a political person to be talking to me about what we should be doing about the coronavirus. Like, they're not qualified, period, end of story. If we want someone's perception of how we're going to spin this, then maybe we'll bring that person in. But I want to talk to a public health specialist, like a populationist, a virologist, a molecular biologist, you know what I mean? Um, right. et cetera, et cetera, zoonotic specialist, you know, yeah. before I talk to any of those other people. So right. um, I think giving credit where credit is due and then also not siloing, siloing people. You know, like that's something, and this was rightful back to your earlier question for me, you know, how did I make these transitions? How did I, um, you know, kind of get my hand, you know, I, I was true to myself. Um, I, you know, showed my energy. I showed my interest in things. You know, I had always sort of a, a Labrador um, energy and, and um, excitement mm -hmm. I had to sort of rein in myself um, on which opportunities I would actually follow through because you can't do every opportunity. And the worst thing you can do is sort of overcommit and underdeliver. Exactly. So, you know, you definitely sort of learn that as a, as a hopefully as a child. <laughs> um, but as I had people that were willing to not silo me, that were willing to give me opportunities and other things, and a part of that is my own sort of communication persuasion. You know, I mean, yeah. We have to be able to be good communicators in our own lives if we're really going to try to make changes. And I think that the onus is on us as scientists. I mean, it's, it's not living in a glass house and working on um, a mechanism of action that may or may not have relevance in 25 years. Like, it's our duty to find out how that can have impact right now across disparate fields. So, so true. And really feeds in, Lauren, to this the next question. Which brings us to what you're doing now. So you're working as a worldwide postdoc industry fellow at Biogen, and you're also sourcing and developing original scientific content for social media posts. And so, you know, you're analyzing and framing science and publication findings for a variety of media relations pitches, including NPR, Forbes, Business Cider, Science, Nature. Um, and others like you know what tips and strategies you know have you incorporated into your approach i mean it's just you it seems like you you're the perfect person to be for, to be doing this role right now so it's been great i think one thing is i so i entered i'm a, yeah this phd fellow program new program new uh, program that they started for PhDs here at Biogen, really unbelievable opportunity to learn about the business and do different rotational experiences throughout medical and then sort of one beyond. And I love the work, I'm working on this passive biomarker medical digital team right now, I'm absolutely loving it, like exactly what I'm gonna be doing 
figuring out you know unmet medical need, working cross functionally across the organization, really understanding what different people understand about the material, think about the material, how they digest the material from a scientific R and D perspective, whether it's research, which is sort of what I'm you know sort of what I've been bred on, I should say, and then um, development, more of the sort of clinical trial design aspects, um, medical doctor sort of perspective. And then now moving with the towards the vendor of technology assessment and thinking about how do we partner on wearables and things like that. So all of that suffice to say that it feeds into this view of like, you know, a business case for a specific study protocol that we're working on, right? Which is exactly the same when I'm working as a part of a cross-functional team, primarily made up of people from PR, corporate affairs, you know, press releasing, advertising, marketing, you know, sort of my mom's my mom and all of my sort of family friends that mm -hmm. I grew up with Wheelbox. So it's helpful and then I sort of understand them. I've been close to those people and um, actually a dear friend gave me this opportunity to, um, for her, the company she works for, IQ360 that you're referencing, where we do all this sort of social media and press release, um, sort of prep, prepping um, many of these scientists for these conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, making sure we're getting the facts right. And I think again, is just thinking about, same to my work at Biogen, is thinking about like, what are all the different perspectives here that need to be funneled into this? And like, how do I take that on both through conversations and then how do I sort of retain that mentality as I'm doing my own work? And so, you know, I'm always sort of, I think almost like the, I, I see myself as how the lawyer and compliance person at a company must feel where they're always like, mm, you can't <laughs> exactly say that. Or like the connotation of this word would imply this, which would put us at risk here. Right. I'm always kind of doing that right. um, for my for my PR counterparts. Uh -huh. um, and I'm kind of like, I think, kind of like crushing their vibe on like being able to like say like cool, spinny, like hot, sexy yeah. things. Right. So I feel like kind of like, you know, less cool there, but I'm well right. accustomed to that role, role. So that's fine. But I think they've helped me with is to really see, is begin to see the value of like kind of spicier, like catchier language. And like, yeah. how can I do that while still being really true to the science and again exactly. i think it comes back to this appreciation of words like like poetry you know like mm -hmm. um I, i'm not blessed to speak multiple other languages but i love other languages i love travel and a big part of that is understanding the nuances of, of language exactly uh, and how that's going to land and i think playing that out giving significance to that i mean so i mean i had someone in my current role but not my current role, but like, you know, in my professional role in the last couple of years, say something to me like, oh, well, and, you know, there's no judgment on this person. I just completely in, disagree with it, but that's my own sort of thing. This person said, oh, well, you know, you don't have to be a scientist to, to write about science stuff. Like, it doesn't matter. You're almost like a management consultant. Like, you don't need to be a specialist in this. You could, you could just like pick it up. And I am like, no, implicitly, you cannot just pick it up because like, yes, you may learn. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to have a PhD. Don't get me wrong. But like, no, that, that, that is the biggest problem about PR and science is that just because you have heard a bunch of facts and you're recycling language, like you're, you, like you don't know, you don't implicitly know why this should be used for something else. You're just sort of regurgitating it. Right. And yes, it looks right and it says something, but is it what we really, again, is it the right messaging? What's the objective? What are we trying to get to? What are you trying to open up for those people down that line? You know, for yeah. example, I think a lot of people will talk about a drug asset and they'll give the details of what type of drug asset that is. Like, for example, some type of, you know, some random word, right? That It's like, why am I taking up, it's like real estate, why am I taking taking up so much space with those three words that no one knows what they mean. Also, no one should care. Why would they care? They're right. not synthesizing the drug. What's the point of the drug? It does this. What's the outcome? So I think for me, it's a lot about, you know, how do we, how do we catch people's eyes, particularly people who are super ADHD or have no attention span whatsoever, or as Ronnie Chiang, you know, I think very pleasantly says in his new Netflix special, Everyone should watch that, by the way. Amazing. The only optimistic comedian I've ever seen in my whole entire life. But he says, like, how many screens can we get in front of our face at the same time, plus the Apple Watch? So it's like, you know, no one's paying attention. And no one's brain is, I think, actually even in the present moment. So how do we catch people's attention um, and leave them with something impactful, whether it's visual or, or, yeah. or verbal? 
and we're going to have to link to that uh, that Netflix uh, in the show notes for sh- for sure. Um, oh, I, yeah, I'm not getting I'm not getting paid for anything. I, although I should, I've really promoted that thing, and well, it's just so great. No, that's super. And I just also want to just say, like, you know, you were sort of saying, like, kind of being a Debbie Downer with your, you know, PR friends. But on the other <laughs> side, on the other side, though, with your science people say, like, hey, like, what you're doing is so cool. And like, the way you're describing it is really boring. So we can <laughs> punch it, we can punch it up without um, being, we can punch it up while being faithful to the science at the same time. You know, I mean, and there you're like the hero, right? <laughs> well, yeah, there's definitely no hero there, but like, you know, it's like baby steps, you know? Um, just wonderful. It's like com- legal and compliance, like legal and compliance feeling like they're heroes. I feel like they're like, we kept them from like getting arrested or, you know, being sued. That's a, that's a success right there, you know? No one called me on the weekend, you know? Yeah, that's that's important not to get sued. Um, let me ask you this, and I know you, you I want to be, I want to be sensitive to your time, Lauren. And this is, this is my, my last question for you, which is, you know, you are so fluent from uh, uh, different elements of, of speaking and communication. And you want to get into the details about drugs, I can do that. You want to try to figure out the best way to do a subway ad campaign. You know, I can do that. High levels of sophistication, the highest levels. Um, but, you know, you're, you're an anomaly. And that's why I really was so happy that we had this chance to have this interview. Um, I'm going to ask you sort of like why if you kind of look at it from this perspective, like why is it sometimes difficult? I kind of, I asked you in the beginning, like, you know, why do you have this fluency? Um, why do you think it's sometimes difficult for scientists in general, not all, but for scientists <clears throat> in general to communicate to general audiences? Um, you know, wh- why do you think you're able to effectively translate your work? You kind of talked about that um, into engaging language that hooks listeners um, but it's it's something that a lot of scientists, natural and social scientists, struggle with. I, I it's amazing because after talking about this with you a little bit during our first initial conversation prior to this, it made me think about that case of how I had never really talked throughout most of my PhD to any of my friends or you know people or I was dating or my or my family about my specific work until like you know specific cases or specific projects I was working on. But overall, I was really not very gifted at this. And one of the things I learned when I left, grad, right as I was leaving grad school, um, we had some like, you know, Harvard retreat for a program and they put different faculty and students together. And one student said this like, oh yeah, this is what I recommend to other students. Like, you know, I make them read a paper and then we sit down and we talk about it. It's not based on our work, but like something related to our work. And I make them talk about it, think about it. And then I pay and I, sit down with people from my lab and I talk and I present my work and I test it out. I was like, whoa, that is a hundred percent what I did not do. And I felt <laughs> isolated and really didn't have a language. And it doesn't, it doesn't really, even if you're not a verbal processor, having the opportunity to process in different ways, visually, chalk talking, um, formal talks, informal talks, doing all, uh, you know, posters. I think all of these mediums, the multi-channel sort of perspective is, is so important Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so important and practicing that skill again like you know everyone's like oh i'm just naturally good at you okay whatever but like keep doing it because you're going to learn new things and you're going to realize that probably more than anything else that you thought you're better at it than you really are you know and like let's not get into that sort of that role where you're not practicing things you just think you're good at right right. i can tell you i can tell you that if you if you think you're good at producing you know video um and being you know being on video um, show the video to like an 11 year old or a 13 year old oh my God. tell you exactly how bad you are. In, yeah, in they the- totally will. They are like, they're they relentless kids with kids. the truth. I love them. I think it's actually why I love kids so much. Cause I'm like, we have no filter to like the same. This is great. Right. You know, they've, they've watched, you know, probably 3000 years worth of TikTok at this point. Oh and, my gosh. Uh, they, they're very familiar with things like lighting and camera angles. Um, and they were, they're very happy to share that expertise. And I, I got to tell you that I'm being sort of, you know, it, it, I'm being a little facetious, but it is so true. Um, they can give you very sophisticated feedback. And like, like you said earlier, it's an iterative process. Communication is an iterative process. It's not a one-way delivery system. Um, yes, built that that's ex- exactly. And I think that's part of it. It's a conversation and developing those skills for conversation. And I, maybe I know this best because I am more of a conversationalist. I, I think I have, I'm like, I, I was, it's funny. I was an e- 
ENFP, and I don't really believe this stuff, but it, it's fitting for this. I was an ENFP my whole life for the Myers-Briggs mm -hmm. test, right? The minute I left grad school, I took the test. I was an ENTJ, like, and not a little bit of an ENTJ. Like, I had fully switched over. So it's like, even if we come in there with really sort of like strong extroverted communication skills, mm -hmm. um, it behooves us, you know, meaning myself, to really learn how to talk about science. And so I think all of this to say, I think practicing more, doing it more, trying it out more, being involved in organizations that are associated like in grad school or not and undergrad with scientific communication, getting into the public, getting into retirement homes, getting into little kids daycares, getting into, you know, vulnerable populations where you're working with homework, math and science with different populations, doing that work, um, doing, going to the, they have, for example, Cambridge Science Festival here in Massachusetts is fabulous. Um, a part of that Ask for Evidence campaign, my colleague and I ended up putting together a whole um, like a whole little slot there where kids and families could come. I think my dog was there. I mean, my mom came. It was amazing. <laughs> Getting involved in the community is super, it's important. It's vital. It's, I can't, I cannot like impress that enough. I mean, I need to be more involved in the community. Like I want to be working with, um, you know, young children and I want to be working with refugee populations that are, you know, engaged and interested in the sciences. I mean, we need to do this. And so that's one thing, practicing it. Then I think the other thing is um, beginning to take on the responsibility, the social responsibility of it. And I think that's one thing that's maybe helpful is that I came from a government background, so I sort of had that implicit um, feeling of responsibility to the public. And I think scientists, both infrastructurally and, and philosophically and personally, kind of like, eh, scary, gross. I don't want to be near the public or anywhere near it like and if I'm up in my glass house I'll be considered a better scientist but this is changing and you know I'm not just telling this for for all people for all levels both for the societal impact and for people personally you know warning you're not going to get a job at a top faculty position if you're not really being engaged and like active on Twitter you know some of the best young faculty at Harvard right now not to say there's not great faculty everywhere else um, and there definitely are they're engaged they're engaged in science in the public, you know, through Twitter or, I mean, David Sinclair, William Mayer, like they, they're active, they're engaged in all platforms, they're writing books, you know. This is a move, you know, even mathematicians, think of um, Amir Azel from MIT who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but he's written, what, 10 books? He discovered the original zero in Cambodia, you know, like, I mean, he was, into, he was a mathematician intimately connected to the power of math in society and how it's influenced, um, by conflict and war around the world. I mean, it's our duty to sort of unleash this. I mean, we think even about people like, I was talking actually with one of my Turkish friends uh, a couple nights ago, and we were talking about the auditor, right? One of the sort of founders, one of the key founders of um, modern day Turkish civilization and, you know, women's rights, science, art. I mean, you look to this person, insane, right? He was, he has written letters specifically from Einstein. I mean, science and politics and society are intimately connected. We have a duty, all of us, to like hone that skill and make it available to the public, to educate the public. And, and it's our duty. It's not the, the, the public isn't stupid. And if it is, it's because of our own fault. You know, we created that. So it's like, it's our duty to find a way to connect with them, you know? And I think I always have that sort of onus on myself where it's like, it's my limitation if I can't connect with people. It's not because they're stupid or like, you know, daft or something else. It's, it's because I did a crappy job tailoring what I said to them. Well, I've got to say, Dr. Lauren Robertson, what a wonderful call to action. What a fantastic interview with actionable information, insights, just a, just a fantastic dialogue to hear from you, sharing those perspectives. I want to thank you so, so much for taking time out from, you know, all of your pursuits um, and sharing your really unique and rare blend of skills. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Mark, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope, you know, cheers, cheers with my seltzer to many more conversations with you. And, um, you know, just to say that, uh, my door is always open. Like I'm always a phone call or a coffee away uh, to anyone who is interested in sort of discussing these topics more. And I think it's great to sit around and sort of philosophize, but um, I'm, I'm really about sort of executing. And so, you know, I'd, I'd say my door is always open to, to talk to more similar people inside and outside of 
of uh, academia and industry and politics and, and science about how we can continue to really change the world. Thank you, Lauren. The perfect last words for the episode. Thank you, listeners, for being here. Certainly have Lauren's contact information, LinkedIn and so forth in the show notes. I hope you'll listen next time for another episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.